The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Ontario expanded the role of private clinics in delivering healthcare this week. Tonight, we'll hear why it's bad, not so bad, or maybe even okay. Also, from our Ontario hubs, affordability and gentrification in Sudbury. And from getting new rental housing built to what the artificial intelligence app ChatGPT can and can't do, we've got the Agenda's Week in Review. It's Friday, January 20th, and that's all ahead on the Agenda. Public health care is largely seen as sacrosanct in this country. It's also grappling with multiple crises simultaneously, some due to the pandemic, some dating back before that. This week, Ontario announced it would allow more private delivery, which it said would tackle wait lists for some of the tens of thousands of surgeries delayed due to COVID. Reaction to that announcement is mixed. Let's find out why with Dr. Rose Zacharias, president of the Ontario Medical Association, Natalie Mara, executive director at the Ontario Health Coalition, and Martin Redcon, political columnist at the Toronto Star. Welcome to all of you in our studios. Now, Ontario has made a major decision, as we said, to expand private delivery of its private public health care, rather. According to the three-step plan announced by Health Minister Sylvia Jones on Monday, the province will add 14,000 cataract surgeries through new centers in Windsor, Kitchener, Waterloo, and Ottawa, put 18 million in existing centers across the province for surgical procedures, and then issue more licenses to open more clinics. We're just going to get off the top what your thoughts are. Martin, I'm going to start with you. Do you support this move? Well, I think I support anything that tries to make things better. And I think we have to remember today that we're already doing a lot of this, and this announcement will just do more of it. Mm -hmm. So this is not... A, the, the Premier did a bit of a Pinocchio nose stretch when he said this was a bold move. It's actually a bit anticlimactic. And, and I know that some people are apoplectic about it. We can talk about it today. But I think uh, it, it is, it is, a, it is a, an attempt to look at the low-hanging fruit and grab it, which is not a bad thing, but it's not going to save the world either. All right. Rose? So wait times have been an issue even before the pandemic and we are dealing with a surgical backlog while we dealt with the crisis of COVID. Many, many surgeries and procedures were being shelved. Uh, no one's fault, but uh, we have a problem now and our patients are waiting too long for care. So encouraged by the announcement with the goal of catching up on the backlog and implementing a structure to deal with wait times. Indeed, Ontario's doctors want to be at the table of implementation, adherence to publicly funded principles a human health resource strategy, as well as assuring that every patient has access to safe and high quality care. All right, Natalie. Yeah, I don't think that this is really about wait times at all. Frankly, this is about privatizing public hospitals and it is a serious problem. The, um, the bottom line is that in virtually every hospital in Ontario, the large hospitals and the small hospitals have operating rooms that are running at under capacity. They have been for years. They'll be closed for weeks or months at a time or even permanently due to underfunding. So there is all kinds of existing capacity in public hospitals. The government is choosing not to uh, support and resource that capacity and instead to take our money and rebuild that system in private for-profit clinics. And I would disagree just on the fact about how much of that is done already. No government since Mike Harris has tried to expand the independent health facilities, the, what are a euphemism for private clinics. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and we don't really actually have very many surgical clinics in Ontario. All right, I'm going to stick with you. I want to talk to human resources for a moment here. Will this change help solve the current staffing shortage that we have, whether it's nurse burnout, two years of pandemic that we're going through, just in general, people seeming to be leaving this, this industry, or will it make it worse? I think it's going to make it worse. I mean, the issue is the only, there's two things that need to be done. One is fast track major recruitment of PSWs, like Quebec did after the first wave, three-month intensive training like they did, get them out there. That's chronic care, hospital beds, long-term care, home care, get them out working. 
Quebec did it. It's a model that could work. This government has refused to do it so far through the entire pandemic, and we're in a crisis across the board, hospitals, home care, long-term care. For nurses, it takes longer to train them. In the short term, the only way to deal with this crisis is to attract back the retired nurses. We need them in the public hospitals. Like, it doesn't make sense to say, here, we're going to attract back the retirees to do a whole bunch of elective surgeries mm -hmm. and leave people who have complicated cancer treatment surgeries not able to get them. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense to shift the financial resources or the human resources in that kind of skewed way. That's what this would do. No, we need them in the hospitals where they can provide the full range of services that patients need and where triage is based on need. I, I do want to add to that, and I'll ask this question, is, you know, the government recently announced that they are hopefully going to introduce new legislation that would allow healthcare workers from other provinces uh, in Canada work quite quickly here in Ontario. Does that change things at all? I mean, they have shortages too. Like, uh, you know, what we're doing is if we're taking the existing pod, we're just you know, rejigging an existing pot. I don't see a lot of hope in that. No, we need a big recruitment strategy. We need to change the working conditions so that they can recruit them back, you know, and they need a way to do it. Like, if they were serious, we'd see a portal, a ministry portal. They'd have a way to Zoom people out of, you know, having just retired, you know, mm -hmm. recent retirees back into various hospitals and so on to help. There would be some adjustment to the big complaints around workload, too many patients per staff, right. you know, um, around, they would do something about the uh, for-profit staffing agencies that are cannibalizing the workforce and so on. You know, none of that has happened. Rose, I'm going to come to you uh, in terms of same question to you when we talk about human resourcing. Will this change help? Will this change help solve the staffing shortage that we see right now? We need a human health resource strategy. Ontario's doctors are concerned about the doctor shortages, the nursing shortages. I've worked in an emergency department for 20 years, and so clinically, I know the value, the critical value of every member of the healthcare team. And I also know what it's like to show up short-staffed, and still the medical, legal, compassionate responsibility to provide high-quality, good care to everyone. Um, who, who needs it. And so we need uh, a human health resource strategy. That's why with a new introduction in Ontario of dealing with the elective surgeries that have been shelved um, and, and wanting to bring our patients and, and get them access to those cataract, hip and knee surgeries that they've been waiting too long for. We need a human health resource strategy. We need an implementation committee with all the key stakeholders at the table, Ontario's doctors included, you know, I do see this, this model as, um, as being possibly uh, a way to preserve uh, and even retain staff. When you think about a dedicated ambulatory clinic um, and, uh, and, and, and offloading the hospital ORs, where those same surgeries are at risk of being cancelled or postponed because a hospital OR has to deal with anything and everything that comes in. When you think about bringing those elective procedures out, then the idea is that the staff follow the patient. And so it may be that hospitals need less staff because those <laughs> procedures are being done in a different focused setting where studies show more patients can be seen and costs can be reduced. Um, measurements boast a better patient experience, a better um, provider experience, which may indeed um, bring back some of our early retirees uh, that have left the profession, um, nurses that have left because of burnout. This may indeed be a model of, uh, of retaining and recruiting more staff. All right, Martin, I'm going to come to you. Um, I see you're, heading, you're nodding your head. So I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to come to you for a response there, but I, I want to move on here for a quick second. Uh, Martin, Ford has repeatedly stated that the status quo isn't working and even went so far as comparing Ontario's healthcare system <laughs> that to Cuba and North Korea. I think a lot of that has more to do with the country's politics than anything. Does he, is there a fair argument there? Is it really that bad? I don't think we're part of an axis of evil, if that's what Doug Ford was suggesting. <laughs> uh, uh, so no, it's not that bad at all. It's pretty good, but it's not fantastic. And there's a myth in Canada that there's this cult of Medicare that we have, the, it's that the high, it's evolved to the highest level, that we are the model of the world. And we forget, yeah, we're a lot better than the Americans. 
But we are behind, way behind the rest of the West. People, countries with universal public health care systems. We spend far more per capita uh, uh, as a percentage of GDP on health care than virtually any other country, developed country, with a universal public system such as we have. I said public. I, I want to just, for the record, mm -hmm. give people some context. Forgive me. No, but, no. But, because Natalie has said it's, it's a public system and, and her press releases, which I get, say Canada's public Medicare system. It is a system that is that required by law to be, by law, to be publicly, public, universal and, and publicly accessible. It is not a public delivery system. So you go to the lab for your blood test, you get your x-rays for the minor stuff, like the, I say minor, when I have a broken ankle mm -hmm. or a broken knee, I won't call it minor, but a sprain. It's at a private lab, you know, colonoscopy clinics can be private labs. And so I agree with Rose that, 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 that taking things out of hospitals is not a bad thing. And so Natalie said that we are effectively cherry picking, that, you know, the, pro the profiteers will be scooping up the best juiciest cherries from which they can skim the best profits and leaving the tough stuff for the hospitals. That's ex I, uh, you're nodding, but that's exactly what mm -hmm. the doctors want. That's what the CEOs of all the major hospitals want. They want to they want to parcel out the stuff, the low hanging fruit that I talked about earlier, because, and I I, I, was, I don't I don't mm -hmm. want to suggest that these are factory farms, but I think the, I forget the word you use, but it's it's A something it's, it's, you can systematize it. My mm -hmm. words, you can streamline these procedures. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows now that with cataracts, you can actually make it a lot faster than it used to be. So. That's, I, I, sorry, I got off on a tangent there, but that's, I think what we need in the debate is context, is, is was my point. And I've forgotten your original question, Jay. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's right, it was about whether or not we, uh, we had a really bad health system oh, in comparison to North yeah. Korea and Cuba. But. So, so I think we're better, I think we're actually better than North Korea and Cuba. You can tell the Premier I said that, but, <laughs> but, but I, I actually think we're not as good as we think we are. And so we need a, and I think a lot of patients and a lot of doctors know that. Mm. And that's why, and I'll, I'll stop in a second, but mm. that's why we had something called hallway medicine. Medicine. Remember, hallway health care, 2018 election was fought on that. It's one of the reasons Doug Ford won and the Liberals lost, because the Liberals gave us hallway health care. Actually, a flu surge, a couple mm. of flu surges gave us hallway mm. health care. And then a pandemic, who knew that was coming, gave us a lot worse. We had a huge disruption, and that's why people are trying to figure out how to do things a little different. I'm going to stick with you just because you brought up the campaign there. It's, you know, Doug Ford was reelected in 2022. Uh, I heard about highways. I did not hear about this. Why didn't Ford campaign on this, on his platform? Probably he was afraid of the reaction. Well, he did the opposite. In fact, they, their spokespeople swore up and down they were not going to do this because mm -hmm. we held 20 press conferences warning that they were going to do this after the minister kind of misspoke and said in a press conference that they were going to expand the private uh, um, hospitals and, mm -hmm. uh, and clinics. Uh, and they literally sent a spokesperson out after us after every press conference and denied up and down categorically leading into the election that they were going to do this. And then two months after the election, they move forward with doing it. I mean, it is profoundly undemocratic. They have no mandate, zero mandate to do it. That's clear. So to your question, politicians do that all the time. And and should he should should every politician be upfront and and transparent about what they're gonna do? Yeah. But I also think the rest of us who are as a journalist, uh, you know, I can be ideological about this. I, I like public ownership. I mean I wish the post office was still run. I, I almost wish that I used to think I wish there weren't postal boutiques and shoppers drug mart because I always thought that that our friends at, at the Canadian Union of Postal Workers should not lose their jobs but you know what those boutiques and shoppers drug mart are pretty handy now for getting my parcel from Amazon or whatever and so I, I just think we also need just like politicians should be honest I think we should have we and just like doctors should be transparent and billing mm -hmm. and the doctors who run these clinics for profit or not for profit, which also transgress transparency sometimes. Sometimes the, the hospitals don't tell you about the upselling that people talk about, which is not extra billing. Mm -hmm. Upselling is not extra, we can talk about that. So I think everyone should be honest in this debate and not just the politicians. All right, I'm going to give you some some chance to respond to some. I was going to say there are so many. There's, <laughs> there's a few. There's, here. Yes. <laughs> uh, and so the only sort of voice in the, for the public, you know, side of this is is me, uh, and I can't. I don't have time to respond to everything that you I said. Think but I'm also I'll, a voice I'll choose. Of the public. Uh, 
I'll choose a couple of things. One is just talking about where you provide the surgeries and diagnostics, whether it's a focused facility or not, is not what this debate is about. Mm -hmm. It's about who owns it. It's whether it's under the governance of public hospitals that are owned and operated in the public interest on a not-for-profit basis, or whether it's handed over to the for-profit clinics. There are ambulatory care facilities in Ontario. Those are day hospitals that are operated by the public hospital system with a quality of care regime, the public governance, all of those things that exist for public hospitals. We do not have that for the private clinics. In fact, the private clinics, if you go and look up their inspection reports, good luck to you, hmm. they're not available publicly. They, the ministry purposefully contracted that out hmm. to a third party organization. Why? Because freedom of information legislation covers things you know under the ministry but does not cover the third party. You can find one-liner inspections on some of the out of hospital hospital facilities and that's it. In terms of quality, those colonoscopy clinics that you talked about actually had serious quality problems. They didn't breach the colon, they didn't do the test properly, there were more missed cancers, there are higher death rates in the for-profit clinics and so on. And in addition, they extra bill patients for the medically necessary tests and procedures that they do. The cataract surgery clinics in Ontario are where we see pa patients routinely being billed $2,000 dollars per eye for the cataract surgeries. The reason we oppose this is not around anything to do with workforce issues or what have you, although they are serious as well. It's because if they hand over, as Doug Ford said, 50% of the hospital surgeries in this province to private for-profit clinics, they'll dismantle the public hospital system and we will not be able to protect single-tier public Medicare in this province or in this country. It's serious and so we will fight it. We'll fight it on the public interest in protecting healthcare that is run in the public interest and not for private profit with all of the add-ons, poor quality and behaviors that the private sector brings to the practice of, of health care. I can't tell you how many emails I've received since my columns this week from patients saying that they were extra billed, to use your word, they weren't extra billed, they were upsold, extra billed by a hospital or by a not-for-profit clinic. So we, we shouldn't conflate and, and mix up this idea of, quote, extra billing, which is illegal in this country. So anybody who extra bills. Name me gets, one gets, hospital gets that's charging patients for cataract surgery. No, like it's being not, totally not honest. For cataract surgery. But the private forgetting, cataract forgetting, forgetting, clinics if I may. are charging patients if, if for cataract surgery. Okay. No, I mean, let's talk about <laughs> apples and apples here, right? I agree. Let's talk you about apples. You may pay and for like a cast in a public hospital, but in a private clinic, you're charged for the cataract surgery routinely. In BC, Saskatchewan, Alberta. Okay, can we talk about selling Ontario? Let's, let's, talk about, let's talk about Ontario. Right, let's get so, so you, you <laughs> asked you asked about so-called apples to apples. Mm -hmm. So, if you're in a cataract clinic and a surgeon says you can get the basic lens covered by OHIP, or you can get something that allows you to take off your glasses so that you won't have to wear glasses anymore. Apples to apples, you can do the same thing in the hospital, and they'll charge you hundreds, if not thousands, of dollars for that extra lens. So you can't say, you can't compare somebody who gets an upgraded surgery in a, and, and, and agrees to that in a clinic with somebody who doesn't get it in the hospital. That's so not what's happening. Apples, like what well, you're describing respect, is respect, not... If I can just finish, respectfully, I have emails from patients, so maybe they're lying, maybe their experience isn't true, but their truth and their experience... We have surveys that, of 400 patients. If, if I can, their truth and their experience is that they were upsold and, and, and agreed to it and paid for it in a the hospital. They're actually not complaining about it. They're just trying to point out that this is already happening. And so apples to apples, if you get the basic lens in a private clinic, you shouldn't be charged extra. If I can, and if you though, are, and if you are, then sorry. complain. If you are, then complain. That's extra billing. Right. In the private clinics, what they're <clears throat> actually doing is not telling you that you have a choice around whether or not you get the lens. They attach the lens to the surgery and charge the patient for it. No choice, no clear uh, information, no informed consent. And there's a reason why that has come into the public hospitals in recent years, and it's in the cataract, it's mostly uh, around cataracts. It came from the private clinics and has been expanded. Not all hospitals do that, by the way, only some, and, uh, and they're not 
in I, I, I couldn't you couldn't find me a hospital I don't think public hospital in Ontario where a patient is actually being charged for the cataract surgery so just they are doing that they are absolutely doing that in the for-profit clinics so, so quick point in Ontario. Ontario. Just, 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 but just a quick point just to be clear everything you're saying is happening now pre Doug Ford and has happened ever right. since they, and they every, haven't and every, stopped and, 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 it and, and, and now they right. want us to so believe they're going to stop if it I, when they bring in finish. way under more the, it happened under the liberal government it happened under the NDP government because you said Mike Harris the liberal but, government but, actually but, cracked but, down but, on but, it but the, all right the we're gonna have to we're gonna have to sorry we're gonna have to go to Rose unfortunately sorry sorry Martin appreciate it but will let's let's bring you into this conversation will this expansion to private delivery is it a step towards more for-profit health care providers or perhaps even a two-tier health system I'm hearing the emotion in the room <laughs> and Ontario's doctors are, are very clear. We want to do right by our patients and we are for strengthening a, a public health care system. In the system already is private delivery. Doctors are small business owners in the community, family doctors are responsible for their overhead, they pay their staff. So this model of care, which we see many benefits to, uh, if implemented well, um, would be seeing the patients that are currently waiting to be seen. I've, as president of the Ontario Medical Association, have spoken with my physician colleagues who struggle with saying to their patient who's waiting for a hip replacement, waiting for a knee replacement, waiting for a cataract, and their quality of life is being impacted, that now they're not just going to wait the weeks or the months, but they're going to wait years. And we know that patients are getting sicker. We know that there is a mental health deterioration when your physical health is impacted. We know the caregiver burden and the relationship stress and the job loss and the general decline of a person's well-being. And so the numbers are impressive and, and, and difficult to wrap your head around. But as a physician speaking with one patient who needs their care and currently not having a way for that patient to have their elective procedure done because it's been canceled, because it's been postponed, then Ontario's doctors have been recommending ambulatory clinics that adhere to certain principles integrated with hospitals, regional planning with a health human resource strategy, and all the while, not a two-tier system, every medically necessary procedure is OHIP covered. No one jumps the queue. There may be an opportunity to buy a cataract lens. However, the OHIP lens in a cataract situation is a good lens, and the care wrapped around that cataract surgery for that patient who's first in line and chooses their entire service to be funded by OHIP would then proceed as the next patient to be seen. That's the integration piece. That's the human health resource <coughs> strategy piece. We have specific solutions in our prescription for Ontario uh, to talk about the doctor shortage and we can go there. Licensing internationally trained physicians that are even currently here in Ontario. Mm -hmm. Long term, we need an investment here, more training spots, even collecting data as to where we need the healthcare providers, where the doctors and nurses need to be situated around Ontario. All of this plays in. But this announcement, this model of elective surgeries being offloaded from hospital ORs, <clears throat> integrated with the hospital all the while, is and can be a better model of care delivery for patients that right now are not getting the best care that they need and deserve. All right, let's talk about the wait list. The goal of this plan is to reduce that wait list, which sits right now at about 206,000 patients, and return it to pre-pandemic levels by March. They think they can get about 6,000 surgeries done by March. What can we expect in the long run in regards to cutting this wait list down? Well, I mean, as long as you expand capacity, so do more surgeries and more diagnostic tests, the wait lists are going to come down, um, except for some things like, you know, some diagnostic tests where no matter how much you supply, the, the demand mm -hmm. keeps going up, right. they find. And so there's, you know, some controls that need to be done around appropriate requisitioning of tests among physicians and things like that. And some work has been done on that. But bottom line is, it's a demand and supply issue. You increase the supply, um, the uh, the wait list goes down. The question that we have here is, uh, why are we not using the capacity we have in the public system? Why has this government made a choice to hand 
it over to for-profit clinics. And in real terms, what are the dangers of those? We've called every private clinic in the country, uh, every private clinic in Ontario. We've posed as patients. We've said, you know, oh, I want to pay to buy my way to the front of the queue. Can I do that? Mm. We've caught the majority of them every single time um, selling two-tier health care. The, ish, the idea that you would be able to, in some mythical world, hand over the ownership and control of public hospitals to private for-profit entities and then maintain single-tier Medicare, not true. It just the evidence does not support that. And we already have, I mean, we'll be holding press conferences over the next week with a whole range of patients who are already in the tiny number of private clinics that we have in Ontario are being told, you either wait, you know, two years, they can make it up, right? The patient mm -hmm. can't actually test whether this is true. This is a physician referring to their own private clinic. They're saying, oh, you can wait to get, you know, six months or a year to get your cataract surgery in the hospital. Or if you pay $2,000, you can have it in my private clinic two weeks from now. Patient does not know what the actual wait lists are. They don't know if that's total nonsense. Right. Sometimes it is. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, has a choice. Do I have $2,000? I'm an elderly person, many of them on fixed income. What do I go without in order to pay for this surgery? And that physician, by the way, is billing OHIP. They're billing OHIP, they're extra billing the patient, they're upselling medically unnecessary diagnostic tests, the saying that they need routinely, that they need extra eye measurement tests for $200, which they do not need. The OHIP covered test does the job, does it perfectly well. It's not even an issue of Cadillac versus not. These eye measurement tests by the experts do not show any additional medical efficacy. Informed consent would say that that physician has to tell the patient that they do not show any added medical value. Mm -hmm. But here, will you pay me $200 for the test? That just, it's, I mean, it doesn't happen. There's no way to police it. The patients would have to complain. The government would have to set up a whole policing regime to police it, then they'd have to enforce. Have we done that in long-term care? Mm -hmm. No, not even after 5,000 people have died in long-term care in Ontario are we doing that. No fines, no enforcement, no license revocation, no accountability. Why would we now privatize our hospitals? Can I, can I answer the, the, your question, your rhetorical question, which is, I can't speak to the question of whether doctors are ripping off patients by misleading them. I'll, I'll defer to Rose on that and whether, whether doctors are being ethical or not and whether, the, whether there's our way or the College of Physicians and Surgeons. But to your question, why are we doing this? Because doctors and hospitals are asking for it. That's, that's what you haven't really answered. Is that the major hospitals, Sunnybrook, UHN, they're all saying, Yes, let's well, do this. And you're making it sound like they're cannibalizing the hospitals. Why would they cannibalize themselves? Don't and know. Natalie, a point that I would want to make as well, and it's just really important, um, there are regulatory ways to deal with, and if indeed there are physicians who are um, tying a medically necessary service to the willingness of a patient to pay extra, those, 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 cases then need to come to light because Ontario's doctors are very clear access needs to be protected and in the system when there is an opportunity to buy an additional even for example when you're admitted to hospital you can pay for a private room or OHIP covers your bed and the um, aspects of your care that are necessary you may need to share a room but that's a decision and a choice that a patient can make but if at any time a medically necessary procedure is tied to a pay out of a pocket then Yes, we are here to work with government to implement the model that's being proposed to protect against that happening because that's not equal access. And so I stress the implementation committee that now needs to be struck after the announcement of such a model and that Ontario's doctors and all external key um, stakeholders would be there to assure adherence to that integration with the hospital, the human health resource strategy, and the protection of the patient that everyone has equal access to high quality, safe patient care funded publicly by OHIP. All right, we have only one minute left. Mm -hmm. I had a few questions that I wanted to get to, but we're gonna end on this, Martin. Um, Ontario isn't the first to expand um, surgeries into private facilities. We've seen this in Alberta, Saskatchewan, you've named them as well. Uh, how is it working for them and, and what is it that Ontario can learn from that? 
mixed results. Uh, B, you didn't mention BC. BC has tried mm -hmm. it, and Quebec has tried it. Uh, BC tried it under a Liberal government. Now under an NDP government, they're retrenching, but not eliminating it. They are there, and which and the fact that BC doesn't like it, it may not work well on Vancouver Island. It may work better in Windsor. Who knows? Means that you can actually roll this back at some point. You, this is that's the thing about having 13 different provinces and territories. You can't actually innovate. I see that Prime Minister Trudeau called this an innovation, mm -hmm. and he said doesn't seem to violate the Canada Health Act. So it isn't extra billing. It isn't two-tier medicine. It's an experiment. Does it work? We'll see. But let's, let's see if the government and the doctors and the nurses and the regulators can make it work, because it does require supervision. And the government should have, could have buttressed it with a more rigorous and robust um, oversight mechanism. All right. I know my producers may not appreciate this, but I'm going to have to get your response on this as well. Yeah. You know, you've, you've been talking about healthcare for over three decades, and when we talk, and we use the word innovation, is this, when, we, when right. we talk about innovation, is this what we're talking about? This is just privatization. Call it, you know, put all the fancy bells and whistles on it, whatever. It's just privatizing the public hospital system. Is it a good idea? Have we not tested it? Well, we've done it for 20 years in other provinces, more than 20 years in other provinces. Governments have pushed it and have had to retrench at various times. At the moment, the federal government, which, um, uh, you know, is saying that this is innovation, is not actually enforcing the Canada Health Act uh, in those provinces in any way. Shame on them. Uh, and so, you know, we have in Saskatchewan, I just got contacted, a farmer has to wait two years for hip replacement in the public hospital or can pay $50,000 for the day surgery in a Calgary private clinic. He's going to have to pay to get his surgery, doesn't want to do it, thinks it's disgusting. He now is looking for help for that money. That's what the retired people who need health care have to look forward to after paying into our public system their whole lives. There is no question in my mind we're not making this up. We have surveys of hundreds of patients. I'd be happy to share them with you to show you uh, exactly how this is working on the ground now. Why would we expand it? It does, without question, pose an existential threat to public Medicare. The argument that you can do this and control the private clinics, not proven, not over 20 years across this country, doesn't work in long-term care, doesn't work in the other sectors we've privatized. It's just a bad idea, and we're going to have to fight it in order to protect our health system. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. But Natalie, thank you. Rose, Martin, thank you so much. Very passionate conversation, very important conversation. Thank you so much for joining us on the program. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Late last year, Ontario Hub's affordability journalist Kat Ashner took to the highways and byways of the province to find out how people were coping with economic uncertainty. One of her stops was Sudbury, and she joins us now on what she found. Hello, hello. Hi, how's it going? Not too bad. Last time we spoke, you were in a Windsor hotel room and you were on your way to Sudbury. Uh, what was your focus in the greater Sudbury area? I believe it was Kathleen Street, correct? Yeah, so... Drove to Sudbury from Windsor. It's quite a long drive, as you might be aware. Um, I went to Kathleen Street because my editor had met a local resident uh, who lives near the, the neighborhood that Kathleen Street is in, which is called the Dunavin. And she had offered to show me around. Um, Kathleen Street is part of this, this the Dunavin, which is a traditionally working class neighborhood that the city hasn't invested in really in a long time. And it's changing um, because of a lot of factors. And I wanted to look at how. Hmm. Okay, so tell us what you found, because I, when I was reading your article, there's a lot of people you spoke to. Uh, so what exactly did you find? Yeah, I met a lot of people on Kathleen Street and in that area, partly because of my, uh, my local contact who was kind enough to show me around. And what I found was a lot of disparity, which is, you know, very much like many places on Ontario. So it, we're talking disparity along age lines, so who can afford to move to this, you know, traditionally fairly affordable community. We're talking racial and job lines, um, and we're talking lines of ability. So some of the people I met were on ODSP and actually were looking to leave the area and wanted to move somewhere different, but couldn't afford to because of their low ODSP rates, um, and lines of access to capital. So this is, you know, I also met a, a local business person who had managed to buy a few different businesses on the street and open up a pretty thriving little community because he had access to credit. 
to, to buy these businesses. All right, so you talked about housing prices and rental prices there. I do need to ask, how have price increases in housing affected that specific area when we talk about Kathleen Street, but also mm -hmm. the Greater Sudbury area? Because obviously, when I think of you know Sudbury and the Greater Sudbury area, I'm thinking that's probably one of the few places that are quite affordable in this province. Well, I mean, the short answer is it's not really anymore, mm -hmm. um, partially because of this, this rampant housing inflation, both in terms of rentals and owned accommodations. I read about some of the numbers in the piece. And, you know, troublingly, um, the increases in rent and the increase in housing costs are leading to an increase in uh, unhoused people, people being unhoused, and just a degree of economic uncertainty and, and desperation, which is really troubling. I spoke to, one of the women I spoke to was Tracy Gregory, who is the executive director of the Sex Workers Advisory Network, Sudbury. Mm -hmm. um, Kathleen Street is, and this, the Donovan, this area, um, sex workers have been, you know, somewhat systematically pushed into this area over the last decade. So there are a lot of street, sex, there's a lot of street sex work there. Um, and she was telling me that her organization, um, you know, is in urgent need of a drop-in center to serve this community, but also that um, the 50 to 100 people a month that Swans, her organization, works with, more and more of them are unhoused. And it's because of this, this economic uncertainty, the raising rents, and the fact that, you know, Historically cheap housing prices mean that a lot of the housing stock over the last 10 years has been lost to stuff like Airbnb or investment rather than being bought or used by locals. All right, I want to change gears a little bit. Uh, when we talk about the cost of living, cost of living has increased for everyone. You've been tracking uh, the consumer price index for a while now. That's sort of your beat, of course, on, <laughs> on the side. That when, yeah. when people ask what's Kat doing, she's yeah. got her eye on the CPI. Why is it important not just for you as an affordability journalist, but right. why should Ontarians be really focusing in every month on, on the changes? So CPI, like the Consumer Price Index, might sound dry, but I actually think it's really important to pay attention to, and I wish that I had historically, as a person in society, paid more attention to it. Uh, the CPI is the most robust accounting of inflation that we have. It literally tells us how much all the things we buy have gone up in price compared to, well, you can compare it a few different ways, but compared to a month ago, compared to three months ago, or compared to one year ago. And that one year metric is a really valuable one just from a, an individual perspective because it lets you see how much more your budget is. Um, so, like I was saying, um, you know, you can look at your own budget through the lens of the CPI. It can really help you with personal budgeting. For example, with uh, food, some food, like food has outpaced a lot of other things right. in general, but some commodities have gone up a lot more than others. So, you know, when you're making your grocery list for the week, um, knowing that one or another, you know, fresh vegetables, for example, currently are very expensive. Knowing that can help you prepare and plan meals around maybe using frozen or maybe using something different. Um, and it's also important, like I was thinking about this, it's also important because it's political. Policymakers are watching this, both you know in government right. and at the Bank of Canada. And the more you know about what's happening with inflation currently, the more informed you can be as a political actor yourself. All right, with that all being said, what changes have we noticed in this time? Uh, you know, you've been tracking the CPI for a number of months now. If some fluctuations seems to be trending down in some categories, tell us about what you've what you've noticed. So it is trending down a bit. Um, overall inflation, which is the like rate of inflation for everything, has been trending downwards over the last couple of months, driven by gasoline prices. Especially gasoline is a huge driver. Mm -hmm. But if you look at core inflation, so that's um, inflation, but without gasoline and without food, because both of those are very volatile. Right. That's been much slower okay. to move, um, but core inflation encompasses all the other stuff we buy. So for an individual, that's important. Food inflation, like I was saying, it's really high. It's remained above 10% for months, and in some categories, is several percentage points higher, which means that you know the most vulnerable people, the people who are actually looking at every dollar they're spending on their food bill, are having to make completely horrifying and unacceptable sacrifices and changes to what they eat and how much they eat. I've written about this a lot with food mm -hmm. banks as well. Um, the other thing that I think um, is notable is that over the past year, inflation has become what we would call like broad-based, which means that it's gone from just being like gasoline, which was one of the original drivers, and a couple of other things that are really seeing a ton of inflation, mm -hmm. to being like spread throughout the economy. You know, the extra costs of, for example, gasoline has spread into every point in the supply chain, so everything right. costs more now. Which means that it's like, since so many different areas of the economy and of life are affected, it's very difficult to bring back inflation back down to the Bank of Canada's target 2% per year. 
The one thing that I haven't seen as much of as I was expect is wage advocacy. You know, where all nearly everybody is losing out, like your wages are becoming right. worth less. And since inflation has hung around for a while and is anticipated to hang around for at least another year to two years to some degree, you know, we, you would expect to see more people saying, well, hey, my money is not going as far. Um, and some people have been saying that, some organizations and some unions have been saying that, but it, there hasn't been quite the push that I would have expected. All right, so this CPI, this month indicated that inflation is happening in an unusual rate in one category. What exactly is that and why? That category is personal care products, which means everything from toothpaste and tampons to shampoo and mascara. This is a really big category. Um, prices in this category rose by 9.9% year over year. So that means between December 2021 and December 2022, which is the highest rate of increase since February 1983 during a previous period of high inflation. Very long time. Kat, uh, always a pleasure to have you on the program. Of course, we will continue to check in on this story. That's very important to Ontarians. Thanks so much. The agenda this week examined cybersecurity risks in the province and asked if artificial intelligence is as smart as it appears. The agenda's week in review begins assessing whether governments should jump into the business of building much needed rental housing. Ontario rental housing starts. Let's just look at the last 30 plus years, shall we? Uh, got a lot done. Rental construction starts got a lot done in the early 1990s. For those of you listening on podcast, we'll just say that uh, it was going gangbusters in the early 1990s. Then the recession hit, and this number, the graph, just takes, it's like a ski slope. It just goes straight down. It sort of inches its way back up through the early part of the 21st century. And as we get to the year 2021, the ski slope is actually starting to come back up. So I guess we need to ask here, Carolyn, what happened in the early 1990s that sent the number down, and what's bringing it back up? Well, I think it was the worst of all possible worlds, and I think Tony will have a certain amount to say about this when he gets his turn. So partly it was a recession, partly it was construction uh, costs and interest costs going up, partly it was a change in government regulations to um, support home ownership at the expense of rental housing construction, and part of it was simply that... Um, uh, condos had come along, they'd come along in the 70s, they'd become legalized, but they suddenly became a much better um, penciling out factor than rental construction. So it was sort What's of a... penciling it, out factor mean? Well, I mean, it was just um, better for developers in terms of profit uh, to get a profit through selling uh, condos as opposed to retaining and renting out uh, apartments. Okay. So it, the thing about housing policy that we need to start with is there is no magic bullet. It's always a confluence of factors that need to be looked at and all three levels of government. I think she said Tony may have something to say about this because you worked for the Mike Harris government at the time. And if you look at the late 1990s, the numbers are pretty low. They are. How come? Yeah, I, I think obviously mo most of the main points or virtually all of the main points were hit uh, by Carolyn. And so uh, I guess I would just expand uh, on uh, certainly was, as with respect to condominiums, it's true that the economics of condominiums are different than rental. Uh, obviously, they have to pencil out. Uh, and, and certainly uh, that became uh, something that was much more uh, economically feasible uh, to be able to get the, the capital into building those kinds of uh, projects. That said, you know, we fast forward in, in the, inter the periods after that, and we know the rental was not getting built uh, at the extent that we needed to, uh, sh except for the last couple of years, we did start to see, uh, I think the chart showed, the numbers starting to, to trend in the right direction again, but nowhere near what we need. And so the conversation really needs to be about how much housing do we need, what kind of housing do we need, and who needs to play what role in supporting and make that happen. All good questions we're going to get to. Brad, let me bring you in on this sort of uh, deeply philosophical question here, which is to say, the numbers have been fairly low for about the last 20 years or so, inching up lately, as we've said. Does this reflect, in your view, if, and I ask you, this is a former planner, you used to work in the planning department at the city before you got elected, does this reflect a failure of the market to deal, to, to create enough housing that we need in cities and towns all over the province? Well, it is a complicated issue, and, and I think there's a lot of dynamics at play. First and foremost, policy at the federal and provincial uh, levels that 
you know, have incentivized the construction of rental, uh, those disappeared. And we just saw that on the graph. And that really changed the investment profile uh, and the decisions for people to park their, their time and their energy and their capital into these projects. So we moved away from rental. There's been a lot of challenges at local government. We have to have some humility around that. Um, our involvement in whether we are helping to facilitate the construction of new new housing, uh, whether that's rental or condominium. Uh, we certainly, you know, historically have been obstructionists in that. There's a very very strong NIMBY culture here in Toronto post amalgamation. That's changing. I think we're at a tipping point because we're recognizing the breadth of the crisis that we're dealing with. And, um, you know, on a, on a go forward basis, the city of Toronto will continue to be a magnet for, for talent, for immigration, for folks who want to come here. And if you want to come and live in the city of Toronto, I want you to live here. But first and foremost, we need to make sure that there's an opportunity for folks to have an affordable option to live. And right now, with respect to rental, we're dealing with less than 1% rental vacancy in the Toronto market. And so rents, supply and demand, rents are going up. Uh, availability is going down. We're facing headwinds with rising interest rates. So folks who perhaps were looking to get into home ownership are not necessarily able to do that right now because of the cost of capital and financing challenges. And so all of that makes it you know, much more stress and strain on the rental market in Toronto, and, and we don't have enough. They're looking for opportunities to make money and create the maximum amount of incentive mm -hmm. for the organization to pay the money so they can get back to business. And so, uh, you know, they are entrepreneurs and they are business people trying to make money and they'll go after anything. Can you tell us how, how this works? If you wanted to attack a hospital, how do you do it? Sure. Well, I think one fundamental difference from, from today's fraudster, the cyber criminal, and yesterday's, which, which plays into the question you're asking, is they don't live in our community, right? They don't have to look anyone in the eye and say, hey, I'm attacking um, an institution that keeps children healthy or tries to bring them back to health. Um, what's happening here is most of these attacks are emanating from abroad, often in countries that don't have extradition treaties or any sort of normalized relations um, with countries in the West, like Canada, the United States, the UK. Um, so, you know, I think people assume to, to be a cyber criminal today, you have to be a technical savant. And the reality is you and I can go on the internet right now and find very simple attacks and play a volume game to see who um, um, will fall for my trap, for my phishing scene, for my ransomware. And, and the challenge here is the most vulnerable in society, that small and medium enterprise, senior citizens, immigrants, and institutions like hospitals and education and institutions who don't have expensive cybersecurity solutions today are the ones falling victim. The, the, these attacks are on all of us. Those who are falling victim are those who are the most vulnerable in our society. But Tracy, it feels different now. I understand going after vulnerable senior citizens who are not sophisticated perhaps in these ways. That's been happening for a long time. Going after energy installations, mm -hmm. nuclear power plants. Mm -hmm. it, is this different now? It feels like it. It is different, and I think part of that it comes from our society and the world is different. So the way we operate, everything's interconnected. Everything's using technology to run our systems. So our, our world's different, and what threat actors are doing then, or cyber criminals are doing, is different, and we're feeling and seeing that difference. And I really look at, we have a very interconnected ecosystem of what people do, the technology we use, and our processes. And so our approaches have to really tackle all different fronts, um, not just the technology, but how we uh, behave and act in our world today. How vulnerable do you think our major institutions are right now? I think they're very vulnerable. I think they're vulnerable uh, because investments you know, need to be made. There's been good uh, investments. There's been good movement by governments at all levels. There's been good movement by public and private sector organizations, but much more clearly needs to be done. The international uh, cybersecurity threat environment is extremely serious. Building on Neil's point, the, you know, the fact is that these ransomware attackers are attacking from uh, jurisdictions like Russia, like Iran, like North Korea. And Canadian institutions like SickKids Hospital are at the front lines of an international global cyber conflict that is happening. And we have to look at it that way. And we have to invest meaningfully and purposefully with that broader view in mind. Are we at war, Charles? War is, you know, is a is a complicated but it's cyber war. word. It, it certainly is. It's cert listen. It is a it is certainly a a very dangerous dynamic that puts our most vulnerable uh, populations at at risk. And we need to take a focused, 
all of economy, all of society approach uh, to this extremely challenging dynamic. Going to pick up on that in a second. First of all, Sheldon, let's go to the bottom of page one here. We've got a 2021 cyber threat bulletin from the Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity, and here's what they found. In the first half of 2021, global ransomware attacks increased by 151% when compared with the first half of 2020. In Canada, the estimated average cost of a data breach, a compromise that includes but is not limited to ransomware, is 6.35 million Canadian dollars. The Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity has knowledge of 235 ransomware incidents against Canadian victims from the 1st of January to the 16th of November 2021. More than half of these victims were critical infrastructure providers. It's important to note, however, that most ransomware events remain unreported. How come, Neil? I think there's a number of reasons why um, organizations, individuals aren't um, reporting. Um, in the, the enterprise space, um, there's a reputational risk uh, piece. Um, there are insurance considerations. We're seeing the largest insurance providers now challenging claims, some getting out of the business wholly. Um, I think there is at the individual level, we're seeing um, seniors not wanting to lose their independence from their family and, and being taken for a fraud often uh, puts fear into them. There's a, a number of reasons, but I think the most important thing that you highlight in that bulletin is the unreported side. We think we have a handle on this issue, and not just for uh, concerted efforts not to report. I think there's so many more that just are unknown. You know, the amount of things I look at in my inbox every morning that I just kind of dismiss as phishing. If someone was knocking on my door to commit a similar type of fraud, my likelihood to call my local police is much higher than it is for all those phishing schemes. We do not have a true societal understanding of the magnitude of this challenge. A simple Google search will often produce links to misinformation. How is AI tech like ChatGPT different from that? Uh, well, one thing, just seeing the quote that you made, is, is Chat wants to throw the humans under the bus. Um, but the reality is that Chat doesn't uh, always behave in ways that are consistent with the data that's there. So, for example, if you um, ask it for uh, the average height of the female presidents of the United States, it will just invent female presidents of the United States that don't exist. Um, I've seen systems like this, for example, say that Elon Musk died in a car accident in 2018. And what's interesting about that is that there's a lot of data that are out there that show you that Elon Musk is still alive. So yes, some of the misinformation it creates, for example, about COVID vaccines is from human beings that have said things that are untrue and it will simply blindly repeat them. But it also doesn't know how different pieces of things go together. And so sometimes it fabricates things that no human has ever seen before. There's, in fact, lots of examples on my Twitter feed um, of it doing that. So um, it actually creates a new misinformation problem beyond the one that's already there. And then it creates a third one, which is that it's so good at creating misinformation that, for example, a Russian troll farm might want to buy itself a copy of GPT-3, which is not, or a knockoff of GPT-3, which is not that expensive, and then use it to accelerate the production of misinformation. So it spreads existing misinformation, it fabricates new stuff, and accelerates the pace. So that's three things to be pretty worried about there. Uh, uh, Jillian is right that there are positives too, but I don't think we can take for granted that the positives are going to outweigh the negatives. There's some pretty serious negatives there. Well, in fact, you, you've gone further in writing. Uh, you've said that systems like these pose a real and imminent threat to the fabric of society. You really want to go that far? I really do want to go that far. And the reason is there, there's the uh, Russian firehose model of misinformation, which is you just spread so much misinformation that nobody trusts anything anymore. It's not that you want to get across one specific thing, but you just want to create an atmosphere of distrust. And I think that this tool, um, like the flood the zone with, I guess I can't say the word on the air that, that Steve Bannon talked about, th this is a tool that can create an atmosphere of radical mistrust. And historically, I think it's authoritarians that have preyed on that atmosphere, and I'm worried about that. Allison, how worried are you that this new technology is going to push us further into a so-called post-truth era? Well, there's an interesting historical analogy. So if you think about when print, uh, when cheap forms of print first appeared in the 18th century, um, two things happened. One thing that happened was that you could quickly spread messages like democracy and the Enlightenment, and it's no coincidence that Benjamin Franklin was a printer. But another thing that happened that we don't think about very often was that there was exactly the kind of flood of obscenity and libel and misinformation that, that Gary is talking about. And 
It was a contributing factor in the French Revolution, for example. Um, so we've sort of seen this before. And the interesting thing is that what seems to have happened is that we developed new kinds of regulation, new norms, new laws, new institutions like editors and newspapers uh, that actually meant that this amazing, it, there's a wonderful book by Richard Darton called The Literary Underground of the Ancien Regime, where he just described this incredible flood of the word that Gary was about to use. Um, I mean, for example, uh, let them eat cake, Marie Antoinette let them eat cake, that was a meme, a misinformation meme from the 18th century. So it's not like this kind of thing hasn't happened before. And we have a hint from that, that the way to solve it is to have norms and regulations and ways of, uh, ways of, uh, and institutions that are designed to make sure that we don't have that kind of flood. I'm not convinced that this is the capacity for humans to get misinformation from the culture is something that is now qualitatively different from what we've done before, but the way that we've dealt with it before is the way that we need to deal with it now. Um, Julian used the example of electricity, and that's another interesting metaphor, right? Um, so when, if you sort of imagine it's 1900 and someone says, Here's a good idea. Every house is going to have this extremely strong electrical spark in it, which we know sets things on fire. Um, but we're just going to put it in everybody's house and assume that everything will work out fine in the end. Well, it only works out fine when you have, you know, a book of code that's this thick about what you have to do to keep uh, to keep electricity in check. And I, I think that's an analogy to what will happen with these kinds of systems. That's just some of what we've covered this week. You can find more, including the full conversations, on our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. And that's it for this Friday, January 20th, 2023. It isn't only the government that proposes legislation. Monday, we'll find out about some private members' bills put forward by other parties at Queen's Park. I'm Jane Jaganathan. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. Have a great weekend and Steve we'll see you on Monday the agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you thank you for supporting TVO's journalism